Hi, welcome back to Partial Derivatives and Thermodynamics as part of the Physical Chemistry Playlist. I'm Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Okay, so in this video, we're going to talk about something called total differentials or another name you might hear this technique referred to as is a, is a, a total derivative. Okay, so when we look at a normal derivative, let me do this over here on the right. When we look at a normal derivative, suppose we have a function, um, suppose we have a function, I'm going to say little f, and suppose f is a function of time. Um, in physics, you're very used to seeing this. So I have a function f, it's a function of one variable, and that's time. So this would be a univariable function. If I wanted to look at the derivative of this function with respect to time, in other words, I want to take the derivative of the function with respect to time, then all that's going to be is an infinitesimally small change in the function with respect to time. And you simply just write this as df dt. Okay? And so this is valid when you have a function that is only a function of one variable. But many times in physical chemistry, we're not dealing with one independent variable like time. Um, in this case, we could be dealing with x and y, or in this case, this could be a, a function of three variables, a, b, and c. So if I, so say this f is force, okay? Suppose I wanted to find the total force, okay? Then I have to look at the force that's due to x, and then I also have to look at the force that's due to y, okay? So another way of looking at a total derivative or total differential is basically, if I want to find the total force, suppose F stands for force, it gets in for anything. If I want to find the total force, I have to find the force that's due to changes in X, but then I also have to find the, the, cha the uh, force that's due to changes in Y, and then I just add them. So the question is, how do you ultimately write a total derivative or a total differential when you have a function of more than one variable? Okay, so here's what we need to keep in mind. This function f, which is what we're going to do first as example one, this is a function of two variables, x and y. Okay, so I'm going to write the total differential for this and explain it and then go over why you would ever want to do this. Because when I do it, it's going to seem very complicated, but um, it's actually very useful in physics and physical chemistry. So what you do to find the total differential is you say a differential f, okay, differential f is going to be equal to, and now that we're having a function of more than one variable, we're going to write derivatives, but they have to be partial derivatives because it's no, derivatives are no longer defined because there's more than one variable. So it's going to be equal to the partial of f with respect to x holding y constant dx, and then we're going to add on the component due to changes in y. Partial derivative with respect to y holding x constant dy. Okay, so this right here is the total differential for the function f. This differential says that the total change in f, the function, is equal to the changes in f when x changes and y is constant, plus the total changes in f when y is changing, holding x constant. So this is an important nomenclature for partial derivatives that you may or may have not seen in calculus three or multivariable calculus. If I wanted to write a partial derivative such as, let's do the partial of a, a is my function with respect to, let's just say t. Okay, partial of a with respect to t. Well, let's suppose that a is actually a function of t and just make something up. Uh, let's just make up a, a variable beta. Okay, so a is a function of t and beta. Well, if I wanted to write the derivative when t is the only independent variable that's changing, then if that means b is, or excuse me, beta is constant, so I stick this subscript beta outside the partial derivative. So what this tells you is that I'm looking at the change in a when t is changing and beta is constant. So in other words, this right here is held constant. So when I look at this differential, y is held constant in the first partial derivative and x is held constant in the second partial derivative. Okay, let's look at another um, slightly different example. Let's suppose I have a function, um, a function chi and suppose chi is a function of alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay. So if I wanted to say look at 
the partial derivative of chi with respect to, well, I can pick beta here, partial derivative of chi with respect to beta, then I'm not, I can't just hold alpha constant, I have to hold gamma constant as well. So I'm changing beta to see how x changes, and then I'm going to hold alpha constant, and then I put a comma, and then this gamma. So if you have a, a function of three variables, and you take a partial derivative with respect to one of them, then you have to hold the other two constant, because there's two other uh, independent variables. Likewise, if I wanted to take the partial derivative of chi, this time with respect to gamma, right, then I have to hold the other two variables constant, which in this case are alpha and beta. So that's how you write partial derivatives um, in, in, in this case, which is what we're going to do um, when you have more than two independent variables. Okay, So this would be an example of how you would write the total derivative or differential of f. Now, why is this useful? Well, suppose I wanted to measure, uh, say, f is force. I wanted to measure the total force. Well, it may be, it may be difficult to measure, measure the total for, force all at once. So I can break this up into two independent derivatives and measure those. Or if I know a function for them, then I'm just going to plug the function in. So sometimes, sometimes this partial derivative right here and then this partial derivative, they might be independently easier to measure in the lab than just measuring the total for force all at once. Okay, so they might be very easy to measure, or you may already know a function. Say you have the function f. Well, you can just plug that function in ultimately, okay, and take the derivative with respect to x. Another reason that it's really good to do things like this is there are cases where you might have a problem. You could have a problem that would could say something like, find the total force, assuming that x is the only variable that changes. Okay, well, if x is the only one that changes, that means y is always constant, and that means if y is constant, then ultimately y doesn't change, so this variable goes to zero. And then all you're left with is this, so df would equal the partial of f with respect to x dx. Okay, so that's why that's useful. The other thing that you can do to ultimately get what the force is equal to is you ultimately integrate every side. Every part of every term in this you integrate. And what you'd be left with at that, at that point is the total force is equal to the integral over some bounds, whatever they are, times the partial derivative of f with, res f with respect to x holding y constant dx, and then here plus the integral of the partial derivative of f with respect to y holding x constant dy. And so you can integrate both sides. If you integrate a differential, it's just the function. okay? And then it's the sum of these two integrals. Now, again, this can be very useful because if you know what the partial of f is with respect to x when y is constant, then you can just plug that into there, multiply times dx and integrate it. And then if you know the partial derivative of f with respect to y holding x constant, then you plug that in there and then multiply by dy and then integrate that. okay? So... Um, we have that, and now let's look at how you would write the differential of this function g right here, which is a function of a, b, and c. So let me go ahead and rewrite that. Suppose I have a function g, and it's a function of a, b, and c. Okay, so how would I write the total differential? Well, that's going to be differential of the function g. That's going to be equal to the partial derivative of g with respect to a, and I'm going to have to hold the other two variables constant, those are b and c, times dA plus, I'm going to do the second variable, partial derivative of G with respect to B, and now I have to hold the other variables, A and C constant, and what's my differential dB? Notice also one thing um, before I go on, that whatever is in the denominator there of the, di of the partial derivative, that has to be ultimately equivalent to what the differential is. So notice over dA times dA over dB times dB, okay? And then my last one is I'm going to have the partial derivative of g with respect to c. And I'm going to have to hold, in that case, a and b constant. Okay? And so ultimately, if I wanted to get total g, so if I wanted to get total g, what that is, I'm just going to ultimately integrate all these terms right there. Okay? Now, 
That may seem incredibly complicated, and why would you ever want to do that? Well, again, I'm going to repeat this. There are cases where, in some cases, one of these partial derivatives goes to zero. So suppose you have a problem like this. Suppose I have, there is some change in A. I don't know what that is. So change in A is not zero, and change in B is not zero, but suppose C is not changing, so it's zero. Okay, this needs a DC there. Okay, sorry about that. Then ultimately, if delta C is not zero, then DC is zero, so that means this whole term cancels out to zero. And so you're ultimately left with only two terms. In some cases, in some very complicated problems, um, two whole terms can go to zero, okay, and you're only left with one.